Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for this May edition of the Underscored Virtual Programs. My name is Marielle Villaray. I'm the Program Development Director of the Office of Academic Initiatives and Strategic Innovation here at the Graduate Center. And we've been so pleased to be partnered with Copeland House and the Ensemble to produce these virtual programs of performances and conversations. We've been doing so over the past year and we will have programs throughout the summer and into the fall. Uh, so mark your calendars for the fourth Monday of every month at this time, one o'clock in the afternoon Eastern. And before we get started, for those of you who are new uh, or a reminder for those who have joined us in the past, we are using the Zoom webinar tool today. So you can use the Q&A button at the bottom register of your window to submit questions that you have for the performers at any time throughout the program. And those will be brought in by Michael Bariskin, our moderator, um, among other roles, into the conversation following the performance. So please do contribute your voice. We love to hear your impressions and your questions. And now I'll hand it off to Michael Bariskin, Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House. Thanks for being here. Welcome to this next program in our Underscored series. I'm Michael Bariskin, the Artistic and Executive Director of Copeland House, and I'm not standing in Aaron Copeland's longtime home from where I usually open these programs, but today I'm in this magnificent reformed church of Bronxville, New York, just north of New York City. And this is really the ideal setting for the first performance anywhere of a piece that Copeland House commissioned from the wonderful young composer Annika Sokolovsky. The work is called To Sing of Sins. And is there a better place to do that than in the sanctuary of a house of worship? It's a spellbinding work scored for flute, clarinet, cello, piano, and two-channel electronics. The piece merges traditional Irish unaccompanied folk singing with the techniques and gestures of written Western concert music and often creates a kind of vastness and spaciousness where we feel almost uncoupled from passing time. Annika's piece features electronic samples of several original folk-like melodies that she wrote, which are hypnotically sung by the famed Irish singer Irla O'Leonard, who actually added lyrics from an old Celtic poem called Lament Your Own Sins. You'll hear the vocal line is full of delicate ornamentation and a kind of free-flowing sense of time around which our live ensemble weaves a, a nuanced, expansive sonic tapestry. And if you listen carefully, you'll occasionally hear Annika herself in the electronic texture playing her own traditional Norwegian fiddle and the accordion. To Sing of Sins is our 2019 Harvest Commission, which we award to one outstanding young artist each year from Copeland House's Cultivate Emerging Composers Institute, of which Annika was a fellow in 2018. But before we hear it, Annika, Irla, and I are gonna chat a bit about the piece and our collaboration. And then please be sure to stay with us immediately after the performance when we will be back for a live Q&A. Annika, um, you just said something to me before we got started, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, this is a brand new piece. You just wrote it for us, and we just um, have been rehearsing it this week. Uh, we had a Zoom rehearsal yesterday, uh, a FaceTime rehearsal yesterday, and um, you were just telling me how you were relieved about how the piece sounded. Um, and uh, talk to me a little bit about the experience of a composer um, hearing a piece for the first time. Um, one always lives in hope that it's gonna work out as we all expect, right? Sure, yeah. Um... I, I mean, it's it's a terrifying moment hearing your piece the first time. It definitely makes me nauseous. Um, and the premiere too is a 
a scary moment. If I often am performing in my own pieces, but when I'm not, I'm sitting there in the audience hoping my heartbeat won't mess up the recording because it's just so loud. Um, it's a, a very vulnerable um, and exposed scenario to be in. Um, but yes, I, I, I was uh, delighted and relieved <laughs> in our rehearsal yesterday to, just to hear how, um, you know, there's a lot of different textures and colors that weave together in a way that I wasn't entirely sure would work. And um, it seems to me that it's more or less working. <laughs> so that is, um, that's awesome. And I'm very grateful to you all for, for making it work. Well, we're thrilled. I, I have to say that we as performers live the mirror of what you're going through. Um, our uh, experience of, um, what shall I say, apprehension um, happens a little bit earlier than you're hearing the piece, than the composer hearing the piece for the first time, because we have to learn it. And here we get this uh, brand new piece of music and we don't quite know what it's gonna sound like or how it's gonna to come together. So um, we were relieved and thrilled before you were. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the piece is really um, mesmerizing and special. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what you were thinking about with this piece uh, once we uh, agreed that you were going to write it for us? I mean, what went through your mind? You know, what, 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 what were you hoping to, to, to put together for this piece? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I knew for, for, I've known for a long time that I, I wanted to create something new with Irla and um, this the pandemic scenario is definitely something that has opened up some I would, less technological possibilities and more, I think, technological um, brainstorming and, um, you know, just realizing that that technology was there the whole time to use. And uh, I've been doing a number of remote collaborations with people since uh, last March. And I thought, well, you know what, like, I would love to make some music with Irla and this seems like a wonderful scenario to make that happen. And um, in also kind of a, another pandemic direction, I suppose is um, a, something that one of my students and I have been talking about a lot is when you're, when you're going through what we as a society are going through right now, how do you begin to find how do you begin to even think that what you're creating is relevant or matters it's really really hard to believe that and you know maybe the answer is that it doesn't at all um but then how do you go to put a note down on paper in a scenario like that what could possibly like what meaning could possibly come from an act like that and i think that a big direction for me has been um just trying to go strip the music down to the bare bones and be as as simple and um, and minimal as possible. Not necess not necessarily in a minimalist aesthetic, but just how how much can I do with a tiny tiny amount of material with a single note with a single dyad? And um, I know there's quite a number of moments in this piece, Michael, where you are simply playing two notes for a very, very long period of time, which you play beautifully. Um, but, you know, there's um, an emotional directness to Irla's voice. It's something that has always really struck me about his voice is um, how, uh, how just emotionally honest and expressive uh, his delivery can be of the, um, you know, the simplest line and you, Irla, you make it anything but simple with your tremendous ornamentation and inflection that, that you bring to everything that you sing. Well, that, um, that anticipates uh, my next question, uh, which is to you, uh, Irla. So how did Annika bring you into this project? Uh, you are uh, safely ensconced in your native Ireland and um, I mean, what uh, what did she ask you to do, and what did you do? 
<laughs> well, I, the manner of the asking was interesting too. Um, Annika and I first met when, when uh, she was a graduate doctoral student in Princeton. And of course, I've known for a long time that she's a very an expert in in the voice, uh, in, among other things. But that she has a particular and deep interest in the voice, mm -hmm. and unusual capabilities in the voice, and unusual empathies with the voice. And so the idea of being able to work with her was uh, it wasn't even a I didn't have to ask myself any question about it once she asked. It was, you know, absolutely. Of course, one hundred percent immediately, for a number of reasons. But my my initial comments kind of suggest them. And she under she understands uh, singers, I think, very well. And I think in 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 a particular way, she under she understood how someone of my background might might best be deployed or might best be asked to contribute or respond or or sing or create or, or whatever it might be. And so her approach to me was really, really amazing because she sent me a sort of a, a very, a, a very um, useful, if unusual, <laughs> uh, set of instructions by way of a score uh, on, on, on this score, there was piano, and there were spoken instructions as to dynamics and other possible expressive ideas that she wanted from note to note, from sequence to sequence. I'm not sure if I'm describing it properly. This is what I remember. But so in other words, neither of us knew what I was going to sing, but she had a very strong idea of the cartography of what she wanted. The duration you mean in terms of, of the, the shape of the lines? Yes, the shape of the lines, the melody of the line, the length of the line, the, the emotion and mood and tone of the line. Um, so it's interesting in a way to be shown part of a room, but not the rest. Because uh, uh, normally, you know, you're kind of shown almost 95% of the room and it's almost harder to inhabit it because it's already so inhabited in some ways. Uh, so the, the amount she gave me, I found it at any rate to be uh, as near to perfect a scenario as I've ever had, because it wasn't, it wasn't asking me to do everything by any means, but it, it was nevertheless conducting me into the areas she wanted to go explicitly, but in a way that was open to interpretation, to the kind of interpretation that I know she understands a singer can bring. So what you had then, you see, was a, an emotional map with no words. So, so oftentimes when I'm working, I might have a text already and the, the words propel me into certain emotional areas or worlds, but here, I already had a map of the emotional landscape. So it was rather much in reverse. You had to find words that might actually sit inside and those the, places. And the poem uh, that you chose, I guess is a, it's an old uh, prayer, a spiritual poem or a prayer? It, it is. Now I, I have the book here. It's. It, if you can see that book there, yes, it's it's, it's so old that that uh, I should be wearing gloves, <laughs> and it's got this beautiful gold lettering on it. Gorgeous. Which and what is, does what does that it, mean? It's it says mil namach, which means the honey of the bee. So what it is actually is a an anthology of spiritual poetry in the old Celtic script, which persisted up until the old Gaelic script persisted up until the 1930s. It looks like that. Yes. It's a rather different kind of script. I don't know if you can make that out, but so, but when I think back about 
your opening remarks, Annika, uh, I find that the, whatever percolation has been going on amongst us all in relation to this last year or so, it strikes me that what we emerged with is a lyric of universal uh, import and, and comprehensibility. This idea of this idea of lamentation, of loss, um, of various kinds of sorrows. Uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't setting out to write something quite as uh, quite as dark, <laughs> but anyway, I'm talking on and on. But no, that, that, that's how we did it. That's how we came upon it. And, and you know, you know, stuff comes together. You know, you're 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 moved by words and you're moved by music and your your musical you know yourself michael your your musical soul takes care of the rest well that's actually a pretty terrific definition of art uh mm -hmm. courtesy of irla o leonard stuff comes together uh it's been a, a absolute delight um and a really really satisfying uh, experience uh getting to know the piece um and uh, we're going to turn now, without further ado, to the first performance anywhere of this piece. I feel sure it will be the first of many. Uh, certainly, we have plans uh, to do this piece a lot. Um, the music from Copeland House Ensemble uh, consists of Bum J. Kim, uh, our wonderful guest flutist, who you will see reach into the piano occasionally and use uh, small mallets to make the strings of the piano occasionally uh, uh, resonate. Um, our clarinetist is Derek Burmel. Our cellist is uh, Tom Cranus, and I'm the pianist. Um, thank you both um, for your really wonderful work on this piece. Uh, thanks for joining us now. Uh, for all of you who are watching, please stay with us after the performance. We will be back as usual with our live Q&A. Um, there is so much more clearly to talk about with this wonderful piece. So uh, enjoy the performance and we will see you later.
Well, welcome back uh, to all our viewers and especially welcome Annika. Um, before we get started, uh, just I wanted to remind our viewers to uh, please send in your questions. Uh, we're here to try to take as many as we can. Uh, use the nifty Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and uh, we will try to keep track of them. Uh, two other very quick uh, reminders. Um, so this um, Q&A, as is the case with the rest of the uh, this program, is being recorded. And uh, the Graduate Center will be sending you all out a survey. We're always glad to hear uh, your thoughts and comments about uh, our underscored series. Uh, eager to hear from you always. Um, so, um, Annika, um, let's talk a little bit, of, for starters, about the voice the singing voice. Um, you have, uh, you are such an accomplished singer yourself and uh, you've, uh, you've got such an, a distinctive voice and a distinctive approach to, um, to singing and to writing for the voice. How was it for you to work with somebody um, as, uh, gosh, equally, equally distinguished um, um, a singer as uh, Irla O. Leonard and rather a different sort of, of singer. How was it for you? Uh, well, we're certainly not equal in any regard. Uh, I've been in awe of Irla and his voice for a long time, long before I met him. And um, we became friends and collaborators. I was a huge fan of his voice and his music. Um, I mean, we're incredibly different vocalists, but I think that um, the two of us love many of the same things within the voice. Um, there's, uh, vocalists are obsessed with color, with timbre, um, because we're able to manipulate it very precisely and, um, and change those colors very precisely. I mean, if you're playing a saxophone, you're kind of the shape of your instrument, it's the shape of your instrument. There's nothing you can do about that, right? Um, but as vocalists, you can actually constantly be changing the shape of your instrument yourself um, within your, your, um, your vocal apparatus. And um, there's this kind of obsession with a, a precision of color and how that aligns with the emotional, emotional narrative of uh, the music. And that's something that drew me to Irla's voice a, a long time ago. And um, that's something that I do within my own voice too, but we do it very differently. And so something I tried to do in writing this piece was to be very careful that I gave Irla room to make those decisions for himself, what kind of color he wanted to use or how he wanted to shape or inflect a line, because that part of his, that is a huge part of his artistry. He's not a classical vocalist. He doesn't want you to give him notes and tell him exactly how to sing them. You need to give him room to bring his own creativity to the table. Um, so that was uh, something I um, was very careful to do in writing this piece. And, um, you know, we're going to be working together again here in the near future. And I'll, that seems to be a good mode of um, operation for the two of us is just give each other room to breathe and to bring their full artistry to the table. Right, and it, I mean, it's good that you as a composer are able to give him that, that kind of room as well. Um, obviously the concert tradition involves carefully notating, uh, as he said in our uh, pre-performance talk, uh, uh, you know, filling the room, decorating the room almost entirely so that there's not, there's less room um, for someone like him who is so dependent on the, the oral uh, tradition to, um, to fill it in himself. Um, yeah, and I should, I should say too that in working together, uh, Irla never saw a written note for this piece, not once, um, which I think is important too in that the tradition he comes from is not notated. It has a very different form of literacy, which is passed down from generation to generation. Um, 
And so I thought it would be important for him to be able to engage with the music in the way that he is most comfortable. He can read music, but he prefers not to. Um, and so when I sent him what I've been working on, I sent him recordings and he sent me recordings back and that's how we did this. So was, I mean, this whole notion, we've had a couple of questions about um, the, the use of his voice electronically um, which to me makes it both very present uh, and hovering over the, the texture, but also a little bit disembodied. There's an interesting dichotomy there. And so I'm, I would love to know whether, I mean, how much of this was derived, as you said in, in our talk before, how much of this was derived from the fact that we were all locked down and you know, thousands of miles apart. Irla is, is uh, living in Ireland uh, and you're in, in, uh, in Colorado. How much of this was a function of simply not being able to travel and work together? And how much of uh, that you sampled his voice electronically and how much of it was an aesthetic choice, that this is really what you wanted to do. And if you lived within two blocks of each other, you still would have done the same thing. Um, <laughs> a very large percentage of it is because of our circumstances, I think. Um, however, um, because Ila could not be there in person, um, it did as a result, I expanded the electronics maybe to places that I wouldn't have had um, Irla been there in person, or I might not have used electronics. Um, but because, you know, we opened the floodgates and we did something with electronics, I thought, well, let's go for it. So um, I'm playing my, let me see if I can get my finger right, my fiddle. <laughs> I'm playing my accordion. Um, there's... Um, that's you. That's you, actually, on... Yes. on the electronic track. Yeah, and it's very gentle, uh, largely kind of atmospheric and a little bit rhythmic at times. Um, it's not the centerpiece. Girla is very much the centerpiece in terms of the electronics. Um, but I, I figured it, it lent, um, these instruments lent themselves to the, the fabric of the piece. So do you think, uh, just in terms of, of the future of this piece, because as I said before, I have no doubt that it's gonna have a very, a rich and and varied future. It's a it's a wonderful piece. Um, is there, in your mind, the sense that uh, this piece could ever be done uh, live, but with Irla in the same you know in the same uh, uh, in the same literal space, the same physical space? Yeah, I think it could. Um, I think there are a few things that. Um would be different aside from simply having Irla there. Um, one would be, I think, to keep um, the portion of the electronics that, um, that I'm playing on. Um, I think as well, it's important to, um, Irla sings amplified when singing with, um, well, in most contexts, and um, making sure that there is a really resonant kind of, there, there's still almost a broader than life um, sound resonance envelopment situation. Um, and then also to um, the Shanos tradition, uh, the tradition that you're listening in is unmetered and um, you're like can sing in meter, but a lot of this is not meant to really be felt in a meter. And I think that perhaps um, renotating some sections to allow Irla to, to really be free to not feel like he needs to um, fall strictly within the beat, that he can be expressive with time as well as with um, the contour of the line and the inflection of the line. I think that would be ideal for him as a, a performer and ideal just for the, um, the, express, es, the, the, the expressivity of the piece. Uh, you mentioned something here, which I suspect that a, a a lot of our viewers uh, won't be familiar with Shanos. Um, what's that's a, that's a kind of Irish folk singing. Maybe you could tell us just a little bit more about it. 
Yeah, um, so the Shenos tradition is, uh, it literally means old style. Um, and this is a basically a tradition that's been around for, I think, you know, as long as we could trace it. Um, and it's a an unaccompanied, you know, solo style of singing that is unmetered, um, that is sung in Irish, which is uh, I often referred to as Gaelic um, in the United States. And um, Irla actually comes from a protected region of Ireland where the government protects the language um, to preserve it. So Irla grew up bilingual, speaking Irish and English. And um, his, his family, he has some very, very famous lineage in terms of Shannos vocalists within his family. Um, and this is something that he grew up doing. This is part of his, um, his life and his lineage. I think that's really um, something special. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, okay, well, the questions are, are starting to flow in now. Um, so we had one question from uh, one of our viewers on Facebook, uh, Daniel asked, well, Daniel first said that he enjoyed the piece so much, as did we certainly. And his question is about uh, what he calls the bare bones of a composition. Uh, that you mentioned. How do you decide what's essential? Ah, my goodness. How did you decide what's essential or bare bones about your composition? Um, and uh, well, there's a second part, which will take even longer to answer, um, which is um, what does the, these bare bones say about you as a person and how you've changed over time? Maybe we can start with the bare bones of a composition. Uh, and and how you decide what's essential. I mean, that's kind of speaking directly to the art of of writing music, isn't it? Or making any kind of art. Yeah, I think I think actually uh, one of my students here at the University of Colorado can answer that better. So I'm going to give her a shout out and then steal her her answer. Her name is Excellent. Diana Link. Her name is Diana Link. She's a wonderful composer. She just graduated. Congratulations, class of 2021. Um, and. I think she and I are facing similar challenges um, in this pandemic, which is, um, you know, we mentioned this earlier in the um, in the program, but what really matters, you know, this uh, pandemic has really forced a lot of us to go back to the bare bones of um, our art or our life um, or our relationships and figure out, you know, what matters here, what do I <laughs> where have I been putting my energy and where should it be going? Maybe it's in the same place, maybe it's in a different place. And I think that Diana and I have both found this um, kind of have felt drawn to a more severe sense of simplicity than we had before. Let's just strip this down to the bare bones. What do you need? And, you know, Michael, you're sitting there playing two notes for the longest time, right? And I, you know, that's not something I would have perhaps written a year or two ago, um, but I, I felt content with that. I felt I didn't need um, more than that. And I almost, I would say, feel I don't think I deserve more space than that. Um, you know, um, yeah, I, I guess. Maybe I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great answer um, because I mean, certainly from the piano bench, as you said, there are quite a number of passages where the piano is sort of um, underpinning the entire texture with this pulse. And if we have time, I'd love to get circle back to that uh, and that concept of pulse within an effort to create a sense of timelessness. There's a contradiction there that really isn't. Um, but when you are focusing on one note at a time or two notes at a time, that's where your focus is. And um, that note means everything. Mm -hmm. And somehow it really takes on, I don't know if I could say greater urgency, but just a greater meaning, just greater import. Um, so um, yeah, it's fascinating how in, in big and small ways, the, the pandemic has Mm -hmm. um, made at least most of us rethink, um, you know, where where we are and and what we need uh, around us. Um, there's another question from uh, Yanis, 
uh, who, uh, good question, asks um, how one meshes, meaning you, how do you mesh the, uh, the different timbres of electronic sound compared to the sound of uh, analog instruments and, well, he says natural voice, um, is there a mismatch? And how do you how do you address it if there is one? Yeah, I think at the at the heart of that is um, you know the instruments are in some space. In this case, a gorgeous church in Bronxville, and the electronics are in a digital space. And how do you get those to feel like they're in the same space? I think that's at the root of it. Um, I think also. There are certain things that a composer can do in order to help kind of make that gel together. Um, one is hire a great audio engineer. <laughs> um, two is um, to have the electronics kind of piped into that space so that they're literally in the same space together. But three is uh, orchestrationally, um, you know, I, I often tried to set Eula in the middle of everything. Um, so there's notes happening above, notes happening below, and it just envelops him in a texture in a way that I think helps it just kind of together. Um, and then same goes for the accordion and the fiddle. Um, I really tried to make sure that those were um, kind of at the top and the bottom of what the acoustic ensemble were doing, and then Irla was in the middle. So that also orchestrationally helps glue things together. Um, and it also helps when you have great musicians who know how to blend. I'm very appreciative to music from Copeland House for that. Thank you. Well, that's also, I mean, uh, what you said obviously makes sense, but it also creates a, a practical challenge in the performance because, you know, if you have a, a body of, of sound or texture and you have something, you know, way above it or way below it, you know, someplace outside of that texture, it makes it easier for everything to balance. Mm -hmm. um, but to do what you said, um, which also makes perfect sense, creates this issue. Well, if the voice is nestled in the middle of uh, sometimes a very busy texture, then it's a real challenge for the performers and the audio engineer uh, to, you know, maintain the separation that is almost an illusion um, so that one can hear everything, right? Yeah, and I also, you know, I think part of it is there doesn't always need to be separation. It's okay if things just kind of become soup. Um, that's my, that's John Adams' next piece, Become Soup. <laughs> um, so I, I was fascinated when we talked about this earlier um, about these folk-like melodies which you had sort of devised and then you had your back and forth with uh, Irla. Um, but as he remarked, um, there were no words. You just sent him the melodies. Um, what what were your expectations about how that process was going to end? I mean, did you think that, did you think that he was going to create words to it or use words as he did in the case of this Celtic poem that he referenced? Uh, were you thinking of, of vocalizing on, on, the, on the music? Uh, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> what were you thinking? Um, well, I knew that I did not feel comfortable. Well, one, Irla prefers to sing in Irish, um, which makes perfect sense to me um, because that's what he pretty much always sings in. He does sing in English sometimes, um, but uh, I, he asked if I wanted Irish or English text. I said, I, you know, whatever you're feeling. The, the thing is with Irish text, I don't speak Irish and understanding the natural inflection of that line and the rhythm and, you know, in a language I don't speak is um, a recipe for failure for composers. I really do believe that composers need to be at least semi-proficient in a language in order to set a text. Um, otherwise, it's not going to sound natural for anyone who is a native speaker. It's certainly not going to feel good <laughs> if the vocalist is a native speaker. And um, so, 
you know, I, I wanted to hand that over to him. And um, he ha has this amazing, you know, library. It's just a treasure trove of uh, traditional Irish um, texts and literature. And um, I was confident that he could find something, even if it was just a single sentence to, to manipulate here and there, which he's certainly done um, before that that would be uh, more effective than me trying to set a pre-existing Irish text. Um, so that was, that's what I was thinking. Well, and that he came up with the, uh, that uh, extraordinary lamentation um, was really striking. And I mean, not only were the words so, um, um, effective, uh, but they were timely, just in terms of the context of, of the piece and when it was written and, and you know, what we've been, been talking about, uh, lamenting our sins and everything we have seen. Um, so I, I certainly found it, uh, you know, the words really apt and, and really moving. Um, maybe time for one last question, and that has to do um, with a little bit of what we've been talking about now in this sense, um, this sort of uncanny juxtaposition in the piece of a pulse, a regular pulse versus this sense of uh, what we talked about before of freeing one's sense of a pulse. So there's a pulse there and it's sort of underlying, it goes back to the way we started our conversation with your worrying when hearing a piece for the first time that your heartbeat won't get in the way uh, because of, of, of anxiety of hearing a brand new piece for the first time and, and realizing it in, in real time. Um, you know, the, the notion of musical pulse as an analog to the heartbeat and the life force uh, is, you know, a, a uh, much used um, illusion, much much used uh, imagery. Um, to, let can we talk a little bit uh, uh, before we go about this juxtaposition that we have an underlying pulse, we have the heartbeat of the piece, and yet it just seems totally unmoored from a sense of time. Sure. I mean, I think you can probably speak to that very well as one of the musicians. Um, so I'd love to turn that back on you in a minute. Um, but I, the piece is not notated, it is often not notated in a way that um, has a downbeat or even has uh, traditional measures. So it's really just this through line that helps a bit with momentum, that helps a bit with um, kind of constantly keeping the sound alive, but it isn't, um, you know, here's a, a measure, here's a beat, here's a, a structure. So it, because it doesn't have this highly measured quality to it, it can just extend almost as if it's like a, 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 on a scroll, you know, we're just scrolling through it. It's not, um, I, I don't know, it's not flipping pages, it's scrolling through, if that yeah. works as an analogy. Yeah, I'm curious if you had any. Well, yeah, thing. I mean, it, it really is like a heartbeat. I mean, you want it to keep going, <laughs> but <laughs> if you're super aware of it, um, then maybe something is amiss. I mean, life goes on around our, our heartbeats and our hearts quicken uh, or, or, or uh, ease, depending on, you know, on, on what's happening around it. I mean, in this particular instance, um, yes, you're quite right that there are, there are very few things that are happening exactly on the beat. And, um, you know, that's a basic musical thing uh, where, where different instruments and different, different parts are brought in at different, you know, in different places between the beats. Yeah. And so your attention is almost more drawn to that. Uh, the, the challenge for performers is simply to bring both of those things to bear, to have a steady beat 
but then for everybody to be playing off of it and mm -hmm. to for basically everybody to be not quite destabilizing the beat, but just, you know, playing, playing around it. So um, it's a wonderful experience playing this piece. Uh, one last question. Oh, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a practical question about hearing the piece after the interview. Um, yes, uh, the piece will be back up on the Graduate Center website as soon as we deal with a very important aspect of this, which is the closed captioning. So as soon as we deal with that, uh, Judith has asked that question. Uh, yes, we want you to come back and listen to this piece uh, often, early and often. Um, in any case, uh, thank you so much, uh, Annika, for writing this wonderful piece. Um, I, I want, before going, to, uh, to just acknowledge um, the supporters of our Co Copeland House's Harvest Commissions. Uh, I just want to say that these commissions are awarded each year to uh, one of the fellows of our uh, Cultivate Emerging Composers Institute, of which you were a fellow, Annika, uh, back in 2018. Um, that is um, Leslie Cecil and Creighton Michael and the Jandon Foundation without devoted um, musical patrons um, and, and supporters. Um, we in the music world and in the world of the arts uh, would be lost uh, without such, such people. So we thank, we thank them and all of our funders for making this program possible. We thank the Graduate Center. And I just want to uh, tell everybody that uh, as Mariel said at the beginning of this program, we are here the first Monday, sorry, the fourth, fourth Monday of every, uh, every month at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Our next underscored program is on June 28th. We hope you'll uh, be back with us. Um, we're gonna be featuring um, a terrific piano trio by the Emmy award-winning composer and graduate center professor John Musto. Uh, we've done a lot of work with John. Uh, he's been featured on this series before and we look forward to having him back. June 28th, 1 p.m., the fourth Monday of every month. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, have a lovely day and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks, bye.